Hey, everybody. Uh, it's great to be back at IOP. I was a fellow here last fall and, and thoroughly enjoyed my time. Um, and sounds like you all have had some riveting conversations over the course of the day. We'll try to keep this one uh, fast moving, fun, and conversational if we can. Um, let me start. David Axrod, in, in his promotion uh, of this, said we want to talk to people who will make campaign reporters smarter. And so we've assembled this terrific group here with that in mind. And I want to start really big picture with each of you and sort of in reverse panel discussion um, mode, start with sort of a lightning round uh, question. And that question is, when you hear the phrase, you saw the title of this panel, how campaigns mobilize their bases, what does that mean to you, campaigns mobilizing their bases? We'll start with Patrick and work our way down this way. Um, so the way I would put it is it's not actually all that different from uh, winning over independence, right? I mean, when you're mobilizing your base, it's probably because you have picked a six, let's say a 60-40 issue. Like it's an issue that's not like purely divisive 50-50, but it's not 80-20 where, well, the other side just going to just say, yeah, I agree, too. Um, that these are winning issues that, you know, get 90% of your base on board, get 60% of the independent, and divide the other side, but divide the, divides the other side in such a way that it makes it very hard for them to climb down from an unpopular position. Um, so, I, you know, I, I don't think... Um, you know, I, I think the biggest misconception I think we have is, yeah, you have issues that are purely kind of, you know, we're talking to, here we are talking to independents, we are talking to swing voters. Um, that's absolutely true. But these two things don't really, aren't really in conflict with each other. Yeah, Emily? Um, I think I'm a bit more tactical. So uh, I, I am more, it is the motivation. It is the information and it is the training to be able to have um, your voters be able to uh, and, and want to volunteer, be ambassadors of your message, and actually simply just vote, right? It is, it is that whole piece of, of that puzzle. Yeah, I, I tend to think of it the same way as Emily here. I think of it as more tactical, uh, coming from a campaign background from, for many years. I kind of think of it as how do we get these folks to turn out, whether they're traditional voters or whether they're low propensity voters. But I do tend to lean on tactics rather than messaging in that regard. Yeah, yeah, I tend to agree. Information is power and getting the information in the hands of the voters, getting the right tools in the hands of the voters, whether that's an absentee ballot or simply just knowing exactly where their polling place is or when it's moved because of a tornado. That information is the most powerful thing we can do to mobilize. So I asked that question for a reason. Um, as I prepared for this panel over the past couple of weeks, uh, I asked this question of a number of campaign types, strategists, pollsters, and I asked this question of a number of journalists. And I got very different answers. Most of the campaign types focused on tactics and get out the vote efforts, uh, et cetera. And most of the journalists focused on messaging, focused uh, much more broadly. What I'd like our conversation to do today is to, to touch on a bit of both of those. And as I say, we want to make this conversational. So feel free to take these questions in, in any direction. Um, Kat, I want to start with you for my first uh, question. When I first started covering campaigns, and this is literally near the turn of the century, um, the internet was, was just becoming a thing, uh, and the most important thing campaigns could do was get their hands on data. Um, obviously, things are totally different nearly a quarter of a century later. And it seems to me that one of the most important things is just figuring out which data to use. There's so much. Um, it's figuring out the best data and figuring out how to, how to use it most effectively. What beyond sort of voter registration, um, what data do you care about most as you're creating um, your strategies? Um, and how do you use it most effectively? Great question. We all kind of swim in this ubiquitous pool of data these days, um, and campaigns especially are inundated with data from all sorts of angles, from the voter registration data to polling data, targeting and modeling data, um, 
you know, which way the winds are blowing in the, in the media and the data that's coming out of that that day um, as you're all sitting here. Um, and so I think the, you're exactly right that it's not about how much data, it's definitely about finding the, uh, you know, 10 pieces of important data within the 100,000 or 100 million that you might have out there. Um, but when it comes down to it, it's all about resource allocation for a campaign and making sure that you're making smart decisions with, first of all, and first and foremost, you know, a candidate's time and uh, appearances in front of in front of voters um, in whatever reach you can possibly get from their money, volunteer time, cachet, all of those resources that you have at your disposal. So making sure that you have the data that's allowing you to um, truly tell you know, it's worth moving a candidate appearance between Maricopa and Pima counties because that's going to get more voters in front of, more eyeball voter, voters eyeballs in front of the candidate. Um, those pieces of the data are the most critical. So I, I just don't think it's always about how much. Um, and there's such a variety of sources these days. There's voter registration, there's the consumer data that's often appended to that. We're modeling scores, we're modeling people's education level, their income level, their ethnicity. We are trying our best to understand the voter, um, but often we are uh, overlooking kind of the voters that are walking in our door, looking at our website, small dollar donors and how we might combine their first touch with the campaign with potentially um, a second uh, nudge up the ladder of engagement um, and using that data across teams and across silos is a big challenge for campaigns right now. John, how much do you use uh, consumer data in combination with all of the other sources that people have been using for a uh, long I mean, time? So certainly we use it every day. It's part of what we do. Uh, one of the things we do is you know, put together the voter registration lists for conservative and Republican campaigns and entities, uh, and consumer data is baked into all of it, right? In, in some states, you have uh, all kinds of information on it, very robust and available to you. In other states, you don't have things like gender or birth date or all this other stuff that, that is really critical to making decisions. So consumer data adds uh, an incredible lift to all that. You always have to be cautious uh, with consumer data, you know, what type are they matching it? Is it based on a household match? Is it based on uh, the individual match? Where do they get it? Because most of the consumer data is compilers of data, right? So you always have to, to figure out where it's coming from. Uh, and there's multiple different consumer data sets out there. So you always have to decide how much do you want to pay? Do you, is it the best one? Are you buying separate portions for different types? Say like, are you buying one set of consumer data for education? data, are you buying one for ethnicity, one for, so there's, there's a lot to consider, but we use it every day. It's everyday part of what we do, um, and, and certainly very important, and I think, uh, just to touch real quick, I think Kat was, uh, was, was right on when she mentioned first party data, which is like generally overlooked now. There's such a, a big um, movement towards modeling data and, and that type of thing in political campaigns that I do think first party data has really gotten overlooked in the last couple of cycles. Yeah, Emily, just to pick up on that, um, when you're, when you're leveraging consumer data, what is it exactly that you're looking for beyond what you can get from voter registrations? When, what are the specific things that you should be looking for? So I don't use any consumer data at all. So what DDX is, is it's actually all first party data. So what we have compiled is from over 500 organizations, all of the interactions that they have ever had with a voter, how voters have responded to them, their relationship with the movement on the left. If you want consumer data, you go and you take my relationship file of here's all of the interactions that ever happened and you work with folks like Tom on the last panel with Target, Smart, or Catalyst, or otherwise. But I don't touch consumer data. I only do here is first party data. And in battleground states at this point in time, I mean, we have three and a half billion data points. We have 85 to 95% coverage in most battleground states. So like, I don't need modeling when I have 95% of the answer. Yeah, Patrick, what about you? Um, so I say consumer data is helpful, but there's only so far it goes. And we've all heard the stories for almost decades now of, oh, well, Volvo drivers, you know, if you drive a Volvo, you're a Democrat. If you drive a pickup, you're a Republican. And the reality is, I mean, beyond the stereotypes, beyond the sort of interesting cocktail party chatter that that generates, um, 
uh, you know, the data that <laughs> we, the consumer data we actually use does not come to us in that format, does not come to us with that level of granularity, or if it comes to us, it's not, um, it's not applicable. We don't have enough data points on enough voters um, where we've identified that to accurately make conclusions across our entire universe. Um, so uh, it oftentimes can be, oh, when we're doing, building a model based on survey data, um, you know, it can, some of these variables can pop. If you're trying to model a donor universe, that consumer data is absolutely a goldmine for that because you're, you're really aiming at a narrower target of people who are probably commercially active and are buying lots of different things and will probably pop up on, uh, on consumer databases. But when it comes to the voters who are the, you know, lower propensity voters, who you've either moved a lot, who you need to, you know, really recontact cycle after cycle after cycle to make sure that they, uh, you know, stay engaged. Um, typically, we're blind to that on the consumer the consumer data front because, um, you know, typically they're they're maybe not engaging. They're not just generally as engaged. They've moved a lot recently, um, so we can't tell as much about that. So we really are relying on mostly on that first party data and on, um, you know, even previous election results to tell us to fill in the blanks. Um, Emily, let me go back to you to pick up on something that, that Kat said. Um, she, she mentioned in passing, turning sort of early touches into more activist types. Um, given the mountain of first party data that you have, yeah. what does that process look like where you take somebody who sort of might be interested or on the margins and you'd like to, to push them down the funnel to become an activist, to become a part of, of a party base? I mean, how it works in my world is folks who are coming in, they're hitting the ground, maybe they're coming in with a ballot issue or they have some sort of you know issue perspective of their, their candidate and they wanna get them involved, they can rely on all of that data that already exists and immediately be like, okay, I, you know, part of my coverage is uh, what are people's top issue? What is their second most important issue? How do they feel in the nuances on any of these sub issues from environmental to criminal justice reform to police? Like, how do they feel about those things? And you can pull that first list. So you hit the ground, you think your campaign's gonna be a, about abortion, you suddenly can go in and pull from all of the other folks whose number one issue is abortion that have been identified by all of these other organizations coming for you to be your first list. And then as you continue on, right, like I think for us, uh, a great example um, of this was like in Kentucky, right? There were a number of organizations doing work on the abortion issue this past cycle. Um, none of them had enough money, um, but what they, where they did have DDX, they would go in and they couldn't see who else was canvassing. That is very, very important. But they could see other people were canvassing these neighborhoods. They could see that abortion was being talked about at the doors. And so they could prioritize filling the gaps of the other conversations that need to be had. So it is in that. And then at the end, all of those different groups doing that work could take all of the people who supported abortion in Kentucky and add them to their GOTV universes, right? They didn't have to identify each person and every, every organization didn't have to do all of that work by themselves anymore they can do it as a collective. And Patrick, I'll ask you the same question. Could you repeat the question? <laughs> yes, I can repeat the question. Um, if you're trying, if you're looking, if you're talking to Republicans who are sort of marginal Republicans, maybe independent leaning Republicans, and um, you've identified them as someone that you could potentially push to become a part of the base that we're talking about, um, what, how do you use data to do that, to make that push, to give them that nudge. Well, well I'll, I'll go back a little bit to your previous question about what, uh, more, what more of what type of data would I want? I just want more and more survey data because I think that that will ultimately ide uh, help us identify what those opportunities are going to be. But um, I think you know um, we have as modelers, um, a, let's say a very accurate map of the electorate. You know, we've got the map of. Uh, you know, uh, we've kind of seen our targeting matrix where you go from low to high propensity voters and you go, uh, you know, from kind of left to right partisanship scores. Um, but we don't often know what to do, right, at each of those corners. And particularly, you've hit on a point um, where, say, you have an audience, like, and I would just say Latinos in the last election, who would be modeled potentially at 
uh, you know, 75 Democratic, 25 Republican, you'd have it, and, and who are, let's say, lower propensity or younger voters. The instinct of a Republican campaign would be not to go after that based on the conventional targeting matrices. But it turns out, based on where the shifts were going to be in 2020, that that was going to be really the best payoff, right? Because you could potentially, by talking to those people, move them from a 25 on the partisanship score to, four, to a 40 or a 50 even, um, potentially. We saw you know, these huge shifts in the Rio, Rio Grande Valley. Um, so if you're looking at it in a purely static, uh, you know, traditional way, you wouldn't have talked to those voters at all. Um, so I think it's more you know, shifting the focus right, from those traditional targeting models that just look at trying to predict static partisanship to you know, if I talk to this person with a message, if I present them my message, how likely are they to move? And I just need a whole lot of survey data to do that. Right, and, and knowing that going in is a huge, obviously a, a huge advantage. Let me ask, John, let me ask you a very practical question. Um, let's say a reporter here in the room is trying to understand campaign strategy regarding mobilizing the base. What's the single best question that reporter could put to you to understand that? It's a good question. Uh, honestly, I think uh, you know, <laughs> asking a question similar to you know, what's your coalition to win? And when I say that, I don't mean necessarily like we're not talking like coalition groups. We're talking like how do you win? Like what are your numbers? Um, and I think particularly depending on the district you're in, some of your districts are going to be, you know, we have a million Republicans. If we turn out 75% of them, we're going to win, right? And like traditionally, 68% of them turn out. Pretty straightforward, pretty easy. Now, I don't know if any campaign's going to be that straightforward with you uh, in, in terms of that kind of response, but uh, talk to... I mean, why not? I mean, you know, it, it, the funny Give thing us all is, your secrets. I mean, you know this, but like everyone, like Republicans know what Dems are generally doing and Dems know what Republicans are generally doing. Uh, it's not as big a secret that they're doing something that you don't expect. You're both running in the same the same district, right? You know the makeup of it, you know everything about it, you have relatively similar data. You know, it, it's pretty straightforward when you when you really get down to it. So really telling them like, what's it gonna take to win this thing? Um, and when you start talking about mobilizing the base, it's gonna be about how many voters traditionally turn out, how many votes do you need to win, and how many do you need to find? Yeah, that, that's pretty straightforward. Cat, is that is that the right answer? I think so, and what was coming up for me as John's talking about this is, um, is asking you know of yourselves what's the turnout in these very close districts going to look like and i think that's been the bigger problem in our narrative on polling on targeting on reporting on how elections might go is not accurately really assessing what turnout is going to look like and i think it is a challenge for the best campaigns out there i think it's a challenge for our news partners in thinking about how we're setting expectations um, and Yet there is some great science and there's some great ability to predict, you know, cycle over cycle what we're seeing in turnout and voter registration in voter suppression. Um, and, and so in part, I think there's a little bit of a partnership of that question of like, how are you going to win? How, what is your strategy? Well, let's talk about turnout. Let's talk about the fact that campaigns have, you know, a marginal impact on their outcome of the race, no matter how hard they try and how many billions of dollars they spend. Um, and so when, when we're talking, when it comes down to it, we can all actually ask ourselves a question, what, what is turnout going to look like in Colorado 3, right? Um, I can imagine there are a number of reporters who um, heard what you just said and thought, wait, campaigns don't have much of an impact on the outcomes of races? Uh, what do you mean by that? I mean, I think we have a common understanding that there is a few percentage point impact that any campaign can have on the outcome. There are so many factors that go into, um, let's say, the, the treatment of voters over time. And what I mean from that is like the scientific effect of any given message or mobilization or um, media news story. They a voter might hear that sways their opinion or their determination to move out, or just like the fact that their car broke down that morning and they can't go to the polls. Campaigns have a limited effect 
to a limited opportunity have a limited effect on a limited number of people. And those diminishing returns just mean that everything's in the margins. Um, and when we think about how we operate with data, the, the whole point is to focus in on those margins. If 3,300 people had voted in five House districts, we would have kept the House. Like, that is the margin of all margins, right? And so when we talk about campaigns' effectiveness and their abilities to perform and use data to set strategy, it is all about that half to one to two percent. But so much money goes into the actual campaigns. Is that money misspent? Do you all agree that that money is misspent and should be spent on people like you? <laughs> yes. No. Maybe on the Democrat side, all the money goes to the campaigns. But. Yeah, I, I also think it doesn't have to be a half a percent to one percent, right? Like, uh, one of the things I saw that was the most heartening for me in this past cycle, um, particularly as usage of DDX went up, is as states, whether it was Michigan or Pennsylvania or Arizona or Kentucky, were using us more, we were removing duplicative work and um, helping to get those marks. Like any place that, you, the more it was used, the more surprising the outcome, the more we overperformed. It was really cool. And so I'm actually gonna say that I think we can have more than a 1% effect. I don't think it is necessarily a 20, but, but it is real that if you are smart about how you use your resources, you can, you can have more of a lift. Anyone, either of you disagree with that? Well, I think it varies by race, right? I mean, if you're talking about so the presidential race, um, you're absolutely talking about fractions of a percentage point, right, in various states, and it really is uh, a question of, you know, where are we going to allocate resources? What sort of theory do we have of the electorate? And, um, you know, which states are we going to focus on? And it really becomes a game of inches at that level. It's like, am I pursuing more, what's my resource allocation sort of, between the Sun Belt states and the Rust Belt states, it's answering those types of questions. Um, but there is a truly a wide open playing field on all sorts of other races, in particular if you look at um, ballot initiatives, ballot measure campaigns, the effect is way more than one point on a ballot measure campaign. If you find the right message, and you've already kind of broken people out of the traditional kind of partisan camps when you run those sorts of campaigns, so there's a huge opportunity with the right message, right targeting, um, particularly on those types of races. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, if I were to say, like, more resources down ballot, would, you know, that's where things would really make, you'd really see a, a huge difference, and, you know, particularly going to state legislative uh, campaigns where, uh, you know, people just aren't as locked in as they are at the top of the ticket. What should reporters who've been covering politics, covering campaigns for a while, um, look to in 2024, what is likely to be the most significant change in motivating bases, mo mobilizing bases in 2024? Over say 2022 and 2008, what are the biggest changes? I think the biggest change in what the media is gonna talk about is AI. <laughs> right? no that was that literally, that literally my impact. next question. <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> Sorry to... <laughs> but uh, that doesn't mean it will ha actually be the thing that has the most impact. Well, let's go there. Um, why won't it have much impact? We've, 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 in most of the discussions about AI so far, we've, you know, there's been a flood of reporting about the likelihood of, of deep fakes and, and distorted audio and video. Um, ways that campaigns can manipulate voters by you know, false portrayals. Are there positive ways that you all think you'll be able to use AI um, in your modeling and targeting as you point to, to 2024? Kat, you're nodding your head. Yeah, I mean, I think we're already seeing some of those some, some of those impacts now. And I think it comes down to places folks aren't really talking about at the moment, and that is kind of in augmentation and automation of campaign activities that are already going on. We're seeing some experiments right now with folks playing around with those fundraising emails that everybody loves so much and asking generative AI to, 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 um, to wordsmith those. I think that's interesting, but not exactly 
where we're headed, there are a lot of tasks on a campaign that could be accelerated um, or made easier by AI if we have a little bit of imagination. I'm not a huge proponent of it here, I'm not trying to evangelize, but I think there is a, a potential for some tactical impact in the 24 election. I don't think to your last question that this is the, the be all end all of change in, in political technology, but there are interesting ways in which efficiencies can be found using generative AI and large language models that will be fascinating to watch and see campaigns leverage the, again, augmentation and automation of certain tactical pieces along the way. Yeah, Good. if I may, uh, I, I think it's, you know, might be overstated um, how much it will actually be utilized. I think in machine learning and modeling, it's, it's been an existing thing that, you know, most people have been utilizing that know how to do that. Um, so it's not entirely new in, in that space, but I do think, um, at some point, maybe 2024 20, is not it, maybe it's 26, but how uh, people access data, particularly in political campaigns and entities, uh, the way that like DDX provides something to someone or Data Trust does or Target Smart, all these companies uh, actually provide data to people. I think you might see less even user interface, right, an intuitive user interface, and it might be more like I need a list, you're actually typing out what I generally refer to as like natural language, where they're saying like I need a list of Republicans that are more likely to vote this year than last year, right, and like it'll start doing the work for you and spit it out. I think that uh, is generally somewhere that you might see some growth in the next couple of years, but I think that'll primarily come from um, vendors and consultants um, in that regard. And how, how significant a change would that be? What are, what are the possibilities? I mean, obviously, easy use, right? It makes data more accessible. It, it takes what you speed. what you have. Yeah, speed. It allows down ticket uh, folks to use it in a in a simpler, cleaner fashion. But I mean, with it comes all kinds of different problems, right? If I type in the wrong thing, it's going to spit me out something. And there's again, there's no person to look at it. So here's your list, right? It's the same way if a junior staffer were to pull a bad list, you know. So I'm not comparing a junior staffer to AI here, but I think it, it kind of has the same flaws, right? Like if you type something in incorrectly by a word, you're gonna get something entirely different. So, you know, quality control, certainly. Could it make the junior staffer obsolete? No, not entirely, because you need the junior staffer to make sure that they type something incorrectly, right? At, at some point, maybe, but no, I, I don't think there's any time that uh, it's gonna replace a junior staffer. And, and it gives them room to be more innovative, right? Like on my team, so part of what we do to get this data useful is we normalize these raw survey questions. So hundreds of thousands of survey questions. I have two people, one who has a PhD and one who has a master's degree who read those questions and classify them. Would I love AI to speed that up so they could be doing better things with their time? Yeah, I think that they could be doing much better things with their time. But so I, I'm, I'm interested in that. Patrick? Yeah, automation of grunt work is huge, right? And that's really, and it's not sexy, it's not going to be covered, but that's really kind of what I would see as the, you know, if there's going to be an impact right in, in 24, that will probably be the back, it'll be in the back office level, and it won't get written about, and it won't be, you know, uh, unless someone is a very clever market, has a very clever marketing team to try to make a sexy story out of that. But I think the hope, uh, you know, at the sort of, at the, you know, for years we've had this mythology around micro-targeting in particular that, uh, you know, campaigns are, uh, you know, slicing and dicing the electorate 50 different ways and creating 50 different messages um, for each of those segments. And the reality is a lot more complicated than that. The reality is not, um, and not that campaigns wouldn't love to do that, not that, um, but it's just way too labor intensive to actually execute. Um, to, are you gonna create 50 different mail pieces? Um, and so I could see the hope, right? The actual application of this um, would be, can you automate the creation of slightly tweak the language of your mail pieces, right? That go out to each of these segments um, that fulfill kind of the dream we may have had a, all have had a decade ago and then have quickly realized, well, we're campaigns with very limited resources very limited capacity to actually execute um, a lot of this unless you're a presidential campaign. So I could see that, right? I mean, if we, hone, I don't think it's quite there yet, but I could absolutely see that as, a, as an upside. Yeah, if I can just build on that, I, I mean, I, I could see a world in which we, talk, we go back to that ladder of engagement and mobilization where a voter is able to go to a campaign website 
and the campaign website learns that voter's IP address and is able to customize their experience, maybe pull in the fact that they were a grassroots donor, that they attend an event. Now, these are the kinds of things campaigns can only dream of orchestrating that push along, you know, from, from interested party to donor to activist to volunteer and making their own text messages out to fellow voters, um, perhaps, perhaps relationally organizing from there, right? These are the dreams of every campaign and there's not the money nor the time nor the team of engineers to make that happen at the moment. So I could see a world in which AI could move us toward that. Now, none of us have spoken about our concerns <laughs> <laughs> up here just now, so I wanna just put that asterisk out there, but um, those are the kinds of things that I could see AI starting to affect in the 24 cycle, but probably won't have a massive effect um, so soon. Uh, we'll move to audience questions in about f five minutes, but I'm gonna try to sneak in two more quick ones. Let's spend just a minute um, before we move to audience questions on messaging. Um, what do you all expect will be the issues that most mobilize the bases on your respective sides in 2024? Emily, you mentioned abortion. In the previous panel, there was a discussion of crime on the Republican side. Where do you expect uh, campaigns will focus uh, on, on issues there? Oh, you're going to me. Going to you first. This is, um, I don't know. I, I, I just want to be honest. It's just not, that is not the world. I used to work at a polling firm. I used to do, I used to be a pollster. I don't, I don't do it anymore. I don't, I don't, um, I think that people care a lot about the economy. I think people care a lot about abortion. I think people care a lot about their rights and their rights being taken away and uh, having the freedom to be who they are. Um, Beyond that, I, I don't know. I'm gonna let the campaign sort that for themselves. I just help them find the people who actually care about those things. Patrick, there's a lot of talk that um, abortion will be a hugely motivating issue for Democrats, obviously. I think you can point to results in 2022. You can look at um, ballot initiatives in places like Kansas and Kentucky, and Michigan, and suggest that, that that's right. Are Republicans afraid of abortion as a motivating issue for Democrats? I think they should be concerned, right? And I think they should be concerned in particular in states where it is a live issue on the ballot where it's undecided. The evidence that we had from 22 um, was obviously in a state like Michigan where you had abortion was on the ballot or in the recent Wisconsin Supreme Court race where abortion was perceived to be on the ballot, was perceived to be on the line, um, where that um, t does turn out to be a motivating issue, right, for Democrats and, and particularly counteracting uh, the red wave that was probably going to happen absent, you know, absent the Dobbs decision. Um, but when the issue is settled, let's say, um, you, you know, we've had a lot of conversation about the six-week ban in Florida, but, you know, we also had six-week bans in Georgia and Ohio. And those Republican governors, uh, you know, were reelected, uh, you know, and, and so in the sense of I think it's going to be a very state specific. So we might actually, what, I, what I'm interested in is to, to, to the extent that our idea of the battleground states is going to be maybe scramble a little bit based on the map of where abortion is on the ballot and perhaps, you know, if conservatives can kind of figure out, all right, what's our counter to this and what, what it, what's an issue that we can uh, sort of place on state ballots, um, that that might scramble our, our view of the battlegrounds. John, what is Republicans counter to this, and whether it's on state ballots or not, how do Republicans motivate their base? Well, I think it's going to depend on who the who the candidate is. Uh, I think that's going to drive a lot of the conversation uh, in terms of, of how they're going to ballot it. Uh, certainly, they're going to have to they're going to have to go after the abortion conversation. They really shot away from it. Uh, I think they underestimated how it would affect things. I think you saw it. I mentioned it, but in Pennsylvania certainly uh, you saw it come up. Michigan came up. So. They're going to have to, to change their message. And for now, I can't tell you what's going to be in 24, uh, honestly, because it's going to depend from the Republican side on the candidates. The economy is always there. It's always going to be there. Uh, everyone cares about their own personal finances. But I don't know what that inf – I mean, is inflation going to be all the way back down? Like, are we going to be sitting here where it looked like you know, a decade ago that we were talking about high inflation? I don't know. That's two years from now. So uh, I, I think from that standpoint, they're really going to have to wait and see who the candidate is and what message they're driving on this. Kat, last word to you. I will also stay out of the, the messaging question and shift just 
purely to tactics, but what I think a lot about are the technologies that campaigns will be using. And when I look back to the massive you know, presidential effort in 2020, it was almost purely a digital effort, right? Because we were all at home. Um, and how 2022 started to marry that new innovation in digital organizing, in text messaging, in relational organizing apps, those kinds of things, um, and how that's going to be you know, another interesting, I think of, of technology innovation in campaign cycles as kind of boom and bust, and big presidential years are big innovation years. And so I'm really excited to see the technologies that come out of um, this 24 election and, um, and also, on the other side of it, the regulatory impacts of things like 10 DLC harming um, campaigns' ability to peer-to-peer -peer text to their um, uh, to their supporters, and and pieces like that that will affect the way the tactical and technology ways that campaigns are reaching voters. Great, uh, we're ready to move to questions. If you have a question, feel free to line up, um, state your name and your organization. And while we're waiting for people to line up, I will ask. One more question. We've spent a lot of time talking about um, tactics and strategy, a little bit about messaging. Let me ask you a personal question, if I can. In this moment of sort of uh, extreme polarization and uh, negative partisanship in the country, when, when you're spending your time talking about motivating the bases, um, mobilizing the bases, do you ever think on a day-to-day -day basis, am I contributing to this problem? You want to put so, yourself so, on the I mean, couch? I mean, I, 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 I stayed out of it, uh, like, right? Like, we're not getting in the messaging game. I don't know. I'm, my dad's a Republican, um, and he was, like, over a decade ago, he was on The Daily Show just being, like, the, the name of the game is not to be an asshole, right? And so I, I believe that is true. If we are not assholes and we actually inform people on the issues, I, I believe as a Democrat, that people will believe in the issues that we support and believe in the freedoms that we support and will be there. And it is that simple. If we stay out of the fray, we're in good shape. We'll see what candidates come up that will allow us to or not. But some of the, some of the people who make up the bases of each political party, if I can be this blunt, are assholes, to use your yeah. language. And you want them to vote. Don't you, as you craft your, your appeals, to them, and I'm not personalizing this to you, Emily, you all <laughs> want them to vote. I mean, it's part of winning elections. But do you stop and say like, geez, I don't know if I want those crazy people to vote for our, our candidate, and I don't know that we want to do the kinds of things that's necessary to get those crazy people to vote for our candidate. I think there's a, is probably a slightly different answer uh, from a campaign perspective on whether you're working on the fundraising side versus if you're working on the persuasion and mobilization side, and, you know, trying to get, get out the vote. I mean, I would say the work of everyone up here um, is, um, you know, I, I would say primarily focused on how do we build that majority coalition, and particularly sometimes we're looking to build majority coalitions in states where, um, you know, Republicans had a shot in New York last cycle, or Democrats are, are looking to retain their majorities in places like Montana, Ohio, West Virginia, deeply red states, and the work, um, that, that work is extremely important, and to say that, you know, just dividing the electorate based on pre-existing lines isn't going to get the job done in every state. Now, it's very different, you know, if you had maybe a political fundraising panel, <laughs> I think uh, they're the culprits here because, I mean, it's really, uh, you know, oh, that nasty about direct mobilizing, mail and, yeah, email. you know, it's, it's issues that appeal to not just the entire base, but a sub-segment, subsection of the base that will give money. Okay, I'll let the two of you off the, off the hook and we'll go to audience questions. Please give us your, your name and your organization. Hey, my name is Austin Horn, and I'm the politics reporter at the Herald Leader in Lexington, Kentucky. I'm curious of all the ways that you guys try to persuade and mobilize voters, be it direct mail, TV, Facebook, any of those platforms, uh, what is the most overhyped way to reach voters from a media standpoint, and what's the most underhyped way to reach and mobilize voters? That's a great question. John, you want to take that first? Yeah, uh, most, I would say most underutilized or is always doors, um, knocking and being in front of voters. Um, my volunteers generally, uh, most overhyped tends to change every year. Um, I don't know, Facebook is still pretty overhyped and they've made a lot of changes that have made it much harder to 
actually target the way you used to traditionally do that. So that's part of it. And I think we're on the cusp with CTV and, and that type of thing. I think tons of value in it. I think it's really important, but uh, I don't know if everyone's going to use it correctly. It might, it might get a, a bit too much. Uh, over to this microphone. Hi, I'm Eric. I'm a computer science master's student at UChicago. I'm curious what would be an imagined view of artificial intelligence and machine learning's impact post-2024, um, particularly for predictive modeling and allocating resources in a campaign. I know we talked a little bit about what we expect in 2024, but I'd like to hear a view of um, longer term. Any of you want to put on your future, futuristic hats? Sure. I mean, we started to touch it, but I, I, I think that there is the ability to optimize and personalize on an individual level across anything that is not a direct human interaction, and even potentially the script of a direct human interaction, right? So you are on the phones, you get a script that slightly changes with every person given everything that you know. Um, the, the mail that goes out, the uh, text messages you get sent, the ability that you search and interact with the website, et cetera, it, it would be sort of that all of those things. I think also I left politics for a little while and worked in government and personally was also very interested in we, we couldn't only serve people in English um, because we needed to actually serve everyone. And so I conducted work in 100 languages. And I am very interested to see what AI opens up and our ability to actually interact and work with communities because like we can, it's not as hard as we think it is. And so I am really excited for that piece. So it's not just personalization of content, but also like language and mode in which people want to communicate with you and have the time and capacity to communicate with you. Over here. Eric Scherenberg, the Newsroom Trust Project. Uh, my question is also about AI. Um, and much of the discussion so far has been about all the ways that AI could save us labor and make us more efficient. But Kat, you mentioned that there were concerns that we're not talking about. Um, what are those concerns? Go ahead, we can handle it. <laughs> I mean, I don't think I'll say anything we haven't um, all had nightmares about, right? Like, we've all read sci-fi novels and we know the, the potential super bad of AI, but I, I think very specifically around um, the the deep fakes that Steve mentioned, as well as the spread of disinformation and the potential. Um, I think about, um, you know, when I think about cybersecurity, I think the potential for the spread of, of, of zero day um, potential vulnerabilities and the ability for those iterate extremely quickly across different technologies. Um, and one of the things that I think scares me the most, especially when we're thinking about applying AI to data science and, and machine learning is, is the bias that may be built there that doesn't have a check or an ethical ability to put out a framework and a lens and evaluation on it. And so uh, I can keep going, but I believe there's a, a number of groups out there that are doing fantastic work to try and think of all the bad possibilities and think about kind of how we, I think we, we all sat up here and talked about the offensive <laughs> positives, but there's a lot of defense we have to play as well. And I think um, the, cool thing from where I get to sit is I get to dream about the potential of good, but there are plenty of ways we're already implementing practices to ensure we are hopefully um, not taken over by the robots. Uh, anyone else want to weigh in before we go to the last question? No? Nope. All you. My name is Tony Sandlaven. I'm a host and reporter for WBOI out of Fort Wayne, Indiana. And my question is simply, in 2016 and 2020, I think we've seen the power of social media to mobilize voters. Um, since then, Twitter certainly is now under new management and a rather prominent candidate is no longer on Twitter. Um, so what do you guys see as the role or influence social media will have in 2024? Human beings will always find a way to connect with each other. I don't know what platforms it will be, but but campaigns will need to find a way to, to connect with them too. I like that. It, it's just that simple. Humans always want connection. We will sort of chase them to where that connection is and awkwardly try to pretend like we're cool so that they <laughs> like us. But I mean, that's it's just the fact of the matter. I don't, I don't know. Anyone else? 
Patrick? I mean, I think you do. You, I think the moves that we've seen over the last few years, right, in social media companies, social media platforms, talking about TikTok maybe, you know, no longer being a platform is just, you know, not building your entire strategy based on, all right, we're going to, you know, game the Facebook algorithm and the Facebook algorithm changes, right? I mean, not being too uh, platform dependent. Um, where a lot of certainly, I mean, certainly campaigns, but a lot of media companies are now no longer media companies because of that. So I, I think being flexible and nimble and adapting to uh, the landscape as it, as it evolves. I'd also say we probably only scratched the surface of the way that uh, social media influencers are being leveraged in the 2020 and 2022 cycles, and we're going to see a lot more of that in the 2024 cycle. Great. And with that, we are out of time. Uh, thank you to Kat, John, Emily, and Patrick. And thanks to you all for your attention and your good questions. Thank you.